Morning. Let's open this morning's service with hymn number 22 from the Spiral Gospel Hymns in Book. Number 22, and let's all stand together.
spirit came for his elect to regenerate and call from the ruin of the fall by his power and by his grace. We were born for God's own praise. Now your purpose we fulfill. Sing according to your will. Sing the song of joyful praise for the glory of your grace. Blessed, holy, triune God, hear my praise through Christ our Lord. Please be seated. Morning, if you'd like to turn with me there in your Bibles. <clears throat> Hopefully this will be the last Sunday I'll have to wear these things. <clears throat> Although Don said I looked good with earrings on, so. <clears throat> um, I was going to say off the record, but I guess we are on the record. I don't know if it matters. Uh, we are going to have services in our new building this Wednesday night. Um, we're going to uh, work out any kinks we might have in the recording equipment and streaming and sound equipment. And then hopefully by next Sunday, maybe, uh, we'll be able to have our first official meeting over there. So uh, <clears throat> Psalm 119 verses 97 through 104, I've titled this message, Perfect Obedience. Perfect Obedience. Cannot tell you how many times I've tried to talk with someone about the gospel. And their response is, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. God's not satisfied with our best. God demands absolute perfection. And that is where the gospel of God's grace in the glorious person and finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ comes in. Pray this morning the Lord will give us grace to rest all our hope on him. The Lord himself said, accept your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and pharisees you shall in no case enter in to the kingdom of god perfect righteousness is what god requires and it's what he has provided in the lord jesus christ i want us to pray together before we begin and um uh, Richie and Fior Diaz are here. Some of you know that their son, Mikey, has suffered uh, kidney failure and is on dialysis and is waiting uh, to get on the transplant list for a kidney transplant. So I'd like for us to pray for Mikey and pray for Richie and Fior, the Lord, to give them wisdom and grace and, and uh, his comfort. So. Let's, let's pray together. <clears throat> Our merciful and gracious, glorious Heavenly Father, what great hope we have in knowing that we are accepted in thy presence in the beloved, your beloved Son, in whom you are well pleased. Lord, we pray that your Spirit would give us the grace to be pleased in the one in whom you're pleased to rest all our hope in his accomplished work of redemption and his perfect obedience to your law. Father, we pray for Mikey. We ask for your hand of mercy to be upon him. We pray, Lord, that you would provide for him the uh, donor and transplant and Lord, ask that 
in the process of this great trial that you would give grace to Richie and Fior and that you would open the eyes of Mikey's understanding and reveal the glory of Christ to his heart. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So the Lord said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter in to the kingdom of God. Now, the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee, and he said of himself concerning the law, I am blameless. <laughs> now, he was speaking of his life before the Lord met him on the road to Damascus, before the Lord called him, before the Lord revealed himself to him, Paul, in, in speaking of his life as a Pharisee, as a Pharisee, he said, I was circumcised the eighth day. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, concerning the law, I was blameless. No one could accuse me of any disobedience against the law of God. And then he went on to say, yet when the law came, <laughs> he said, well, he said, he said, uh, without the law, I was alive. <laughs> I was alive. I trusted in my righteousness for the hope of my salvation. But when the law came, <laughs> then sin revived and I died. Now, what was the difference? Paul was looking, Saul of Tarsus was looking as a Pharisee to his outward performance of the law for his righteousness before God. But when God revealed the true nature of the law to his heart, <laughs> and, and, he, and he sums up what happened when the law came and sin revived and he died, spiritually died before God. Um, he said, when I realized the law didn't just speak to my outward behavior, the law spoke to the intent of my heart. Because the law said, thou shalt not covet. <laughs> and when I realized that, the, that God was looking at the heart and the thoughts and the intents of the heart, then sin revived. I became a sinner, and I died. I had no hope of salvation based on my righteousness. I was completely dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ for all my righteousness before God. That's the new birth. <laughs> That's the new birth. When the Lord makes you to be a sinner, when he causes you to see that you've never been able to satisfy any part of God's law by your own strength and that, that, that you stand guilty before God. That's what Job came to the conclusion of after the Lord spoke to him. The first words out of his mouth were, behold, behold. And that word means I see something I never saw before. I am vile for truly i had spoken without knowledge <laughs> uh, i had heard of god by the hearing of mine ear but now mine eyes have seen him and i repent in dust and ashes that's why we preach christ we preach christ in hopes that the spirit of god will open the eyes of our understanding enabling us to see him in the splendor of his glory as the only one who obey God's law. And in seeing him, we automatically see ourselves. <laughs> Isaiah saw it that way. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And what's the first words out of his mouth? Woe is me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the king. <laughs> and if he doesn't have mercy upon me, I will die in his presence. <clears throat> Psalm 119, we've seen over and over again, as is true in all the Psalms, relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And it's so clear in these verses. And only by virtue of faith in Christ can it relate to us. So we read these passages and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that they are true for us. But outside of Christ, we can never, ever measure up. <clears throat> you have your Bibles open to Psalm 119. Look at verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. All the day. Let me ask you a question. Do you meditate on God's word every minute of every day? <laughs> That's the requirement of the law. When, when the Lord summarized the law, he said, this is the summary of the law, that you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul. And the intent in that passage is all of the time. <laughs> That's what God requires. That every thought, every intent, every word, every action be in perfect obedience to the word of God. Who can say, oh, how I love thy law. I meditate on it all the time, <laughs> every day. As the living word of God, and that's who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He is the living word of God. The word became flesh. The word dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, the one who is full of grace and full of truth. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ is the word that returned to God, not void, not void, but with the names of those for whom he lived and died. <laughs> and he intercedes on behalf of his church right now, seated, seated at the right hand of God until he makes his enemies to be his footstool. You see, we are by nature at enmity with God. And unless the Lord Jesus Christ reconciles us to God um, and makes us to sit at his feet, by nature, by nature, we say, I'm not going to have that man reign over me. I'm going to have it my way. I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> and then the Lord breaks that spirit of rebellion and causes us to bow before him. And we sit at his feet. <laughs> and the Lord says to every one of his children, as he said of Mary, Mary, Martha has chosen that one thing that is needful. She's sitting here at my feet, listening to my words. The Lord Jesus Christ, as the living word of God, had every thought by virtue of his nature. Every thought and every word was the word of God. <laughs> now, by contrast, you and I have to weigh our words, don't we? I hope we do. I hope we have a filter between our minds and our mouths, those who don't. And when we don't, we're being foolish. We need to be careful how we speak. Uh, why? Because we have so many vain thoughts. <laughs> we have so many so many words in our minds that ought not to be spoken. We have to weigh our thoughts. We have to ask ourselves, is it true? <laughs> is it profitable? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Um, and if it, if it doesn't meet the qualification of those questions, then we ought not to speak them. You know, the Lord Jesus never had to, he never had to weigh his words. He never had to ask those questions. <laughs> he meditated by, by, by his nature as the word of God. Every thought he had was the word of God. <laughs> every word he spoke was the word of God. And that's what God requires. That's what he requires. He's not satisfied with our good works, making up for our sin. He, God sees us. He, he, he sees the and here's what the Lord said. The heart is wicked, deceitful. Who can know it? Deceitful above all things. Well, you know that's true of your own heart, isn't it? You know it's true of your own thoughts.
The Lord said in John chapter 6, after he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. (laughs) Now, the bread is a picture of that word, the word of God that feeds our souls. Give us this day our daily bread. Not as your father ate in the wilderness, speaking of that manna, and died. And he went on to say, unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, there's no life in you. And uh, those that were listening to him were greatly offended. They, 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 I don't know what they thought. They thought, talking about cannibalism? What's he talking Now, eating of the body of Christ is looking to the life that the Lord Jesus Christ lived in his flesh as our only righteousness before God. Drinking of his blood is looking to his sacrificial death in faith as the only atoning sacrifice sufficient before God as a covering for our sins. And then when he saw that they were offended, he said this, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. (laughs) You have heard it said of old, and he repeated the doctors of the law, but I say unto thee, (laughs) you know, the prophets of God always had to say, thus saith the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ never spoke like that. He never spoke like that. He said, I say unto you. (laughs) He didn't have to say, thus saith the Lord. He is the Lord. (laughs) And every word that he spoke was the word of God. And so he was able to say, I say unto you. Never a man spake like this man. His authority, he spoke with authority, the scripture says, not like the scribes, not like the scribes. The scribes, when they spoke, they would say, well, you know, it might be this way, it might be that way, it seems like to me. The Lord spoke with absolute authority. And God's people listened to his word. And they rejoice in knowing that his words are spirit. They can only be understood by the spirit of God. The natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit. They are spiritually discerned. Lord, give us your spirit. And they are life. (laughs) We have no life outside of Christ. Christ Jesus, the Lord, is our life. And we know him by what he spoke. Just like we know one another. You know what's in a man's heart by what comes out of his mouth. Uh, Out of the the mouth flows the issues of life. (laughs) So, you know, we, 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 we weigh the words that we hear. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke those words. Now, by virtue of our union with Christ, by virtue of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, looking unto him, for all our righteousness and all our obedience before God. I want you to see a passage of scripture. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now the the general principle of this passage is all, is often quoted in reference to the hope of glory. Um, Paul, the apostle, and John, the apostle, at least in two different occasions, were caught up into the third heaven. They were given a vision of heaven, and they saw things that were unspeakable. They could not reveal them in words. Human language was not sufficient to describe them. (laughs) And uh, I often think of that when I read this verse. But I also want you to understand this verse in its context. Okay, look at verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen. This comes from Isaiah chapter 64. Nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 
I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you are also. But that's not really the context of this verse. It, what I just said is perfectly true and consistent with all of Scripture. But look at the context. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. God has revealed to us that we're sinners. God has revealed to us that Christ Jesus the Lord is the only sufficient righteousness that we have before God. He's revealed to us his nature as the Son of God. And he's given us faith to look to Christ for all the hope of our salvation. Look at verse 11. But what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Could you imagine what chaos, what confusion, what conflict there would be in this world if we were able to read one another's minds? <laughs> I mean, it'd be pretty bad, wouldn't it? Nobody knows what's in the heart of a man except that man. You know, you listen to him speak enough and you can kind of get an idea of what he believes, but, you know, we're, because we guard our words, don't we? Uh, and rightfully so. And so it is with, the, with God. No one knows the mind of God except the Spirit of God. Now, verse 12, we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. We've been given the Spirit of God so that we might know what things are freely given unto us. The forgiveness of sin is the free gift of God. Eternal life is the free gift of God. These things have to be given to us, and we can know this only by the Spirit of God. Verse 13, which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. We don't, we don't try to explain these things with human reason or logic or philosophy. No, we explain them with the scriptures. But which the Holy Ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And that's what we're doing right now. We're comparing 1 Corinthians chapter 2 to Psalm 119. And all of God's word complements God's word and reinforces God's word. So how do we know what's in the heart of God? By comparing the spiritual to the spiritual. By looking to what God says. And know that when we listen to a man speak, we always have to know that that man's like us. So is what he's saying true? Does he really mean what he's saying? Is he being sincere? <laughs> and, uh, and we have to, but when we listen to the word of God, we never have to ask that question. He always means what he says. He always says what he means. And he gives his people the mind of Christ and the spirit of God in order to be able to hear the word of God. Verse 14, but the natural man, the unbeliever, receiveth not the things of the Spirit. He doesn't have the capacity. Look, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. The unbeliever can't understand the word of God. He can't believe on Christ. You see, that's why the Lord said to Nicodemus, except you be born again, you shall in no wise enter in the kingdom. You shall in no wise see the kingdom of God is what he said. You can't even perceive of the kingdom of God until you receive the new birth. 
<laughs> that's why we don't believe in free will. We don't believe that, you know, we have to make a decision and then, you know, God blesses. No, the new birth is an act of God's spirit. That's what the Lord said to Nicodemus. That which is of the flesh is flesh, and that which is of the spirit is spirit. The flesh profiteth nothing. The spirit of God's like the wind. You don't know where he's coming from. <laughs> he listeth whithersoever he wills. He goes wherever, wherever he chooses to go. But unless the spirit of God blows life into your heart, you will not see the kingdom of God. The new birth is a unilateral, sovereign work of God without consulting our will or our works. It's a work of grace in the heart. And that's what the Lord's saying. Unless I, by my spirit, give you life, you can't perceive the things of God. But when you're given the new birth, you're given the spirit of God. And the Spirit of God unstops your ears. The Spirit of God opens the eyes of your understanding. The Spirit of God gives you a heart of faith to believe every word. You say, well, how much of God's word do I have to believe to be a believer? By the very definition of believer, every word of it. Every word of it. And God's people do, and they rejoice. In believing everything. Now, am I saying that you fully understand it? You don't, you don't fully understand any of it. Any of it. But you believe it. Now, the pride of man, in particular, particularly in the in the reform movement, makes understanding the prerequisite for faith. You can't have faith until you understand. And that's just backwards. That's why they exalt human knowledge and, and education and human reason and all those sort of things. No, these things come by the Spirit of God. You don't understand them until you believe them. That's how. And, then, and even then, that understanding is, is, is incomplete, isn't it? <laughs> but we believe every word God says. Look at, uh, look at the rest of this passage. He cannot know them because they are spiritually discerned, but he that is spiritual. Now, that doesn't mean that you've got some sort of esoteric life of, of you know, of, of monkism or something. I don't know. You know, it doesn't mean that at all. That's not what being spiritual is. It means you have the spirit of God. It doesn't mean you walk around acting weird. It means that God's given you his spirit. To discern the things that are true. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. <laughs> what a, Paul said, I, I'm not worried about other men's judgments. And may I say, I don't even judge myself. My judgment is before God. And the hope is that I'm going to be judged in Christ. That his righteousness is going to be sufficient. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. That's what the Lord gives us in the new birth. He gives us, well, instead of David, he's a man after God's own heart. <laughs> And that's what the Lord gives us. And then he gives us a new nature, he gives us the mind of Christ. He gives us the ability to believe on Christ, to rest all our hope on him. And to see that his meditation on God's word all the time is our righteousness. Go back with me to our text. Psalm 119. <clears throat> Oh, how I love thy law. And we do love that. The word law here is not just a reference to the Ten Commandments. It's a reference to the entire canon of Scripture. And so the child of God says, oh, I love God's law. I love his word. <laughs> it's by his word that he makes himself known to me. It's not by man's words. It's by God's word. It is my meditation all the day. The Spirit of God, when I'm not meditating on the things of God, 
my mind goes in bad places, the Spirit of God is the one who brings me back. <laughs> and that's why we're back here today, isn't it? Because this is the means by which the Lord brings us back to Christ. We live in a world. We, we, we we're like those disciples who were having their feet washed. And, uh, and, and Peter resisted the Lord in having his feet washed. And he said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. And Peter said, oh, don't wash just my feet. Wash me all over. And the Lord said, you're already clean. <laughs> you're already clean. <laughs> How are you clean? You're clean by the righteousness and the grace and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? You've been walking out there in the world. And you come in, your feet are dirty. You got to have your feet cleaned over and over and over again, don't we? Verse 98. Though through thy commandments... Uh, thou, I'm sorry, thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. Not my enemies are ever with me. Your commandments are ever with me. And because your commandments are ever with me, you have made me wiser than my enemies. Oh, that's an understatement when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? When uh, they came to him and said, by what authority do you do these things? The Lord trying to trap him. And the Lord said, tell you what, I'm going to ask you a question. And if you answer the question I'm going to ask you, then I'll answer your question. He had already answered the question that his authority was from God. But he said to them, he said, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it of man? <laughs> and they said, they consulted together. They said, well, that's a tough question. What do we say? If we say it's from heaven, then he's going to ask us, why didn't we believe on John's preaching? What did John preach? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. John the Baptist preached Christ and pointed to Christ. And he said, I must decrease and he must increase. And if, then if John's baptism and John's message was from heaven, why did not you believe on John? And... Uh, they said, but if we say it is of man, then, uh, you know, the people will turn against us because they love him. And so they came back and they said, we can't tell. <laughs> and he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. In another place in Matthew chapter 22, he asked them, he said, uh, he said, who's, he said, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they said, well, he's the son of David. <laughs> and the Lord said, well, then if he be the son of David, then why did David, speaking by the Spirit of God, call him Lord? When David said, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou here at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. No man was able to answer him a word. Neither did any man from that day forward ask him any more questions. <laughs> now go back with me to our text. Thou, through thy commandments, has made me wiser than mine enemies. He was never intimidated. <laughs> he was never caught without an answer. No, he's wiser than all his enemies, and he's wiser than his enemies today. Scripture says that the wisdom of God is foolishness unto man. And then he goes on to say that the foolishness of God is wiser than man. <laughs> so, you know, the simplest truths of God put man in his place, humbles us. Lord, if you don't, if you don't show your wisdom to me, I'll be a fool. I'll be a fool. And in Christ, in Christ, we can speak boldly 
we can speak confidently, we can speak unapologetically if we're speaking the truth. We're speaking the truth. In my experience, as one who's been called of God to do a lot of speaking on the truth, has been that the enemies of God cannot refute the message of God with the Word of God. <laughs> oh, they try to refute it with historical examples or with human reason or with philosophy, but they cannot take the Word of God and refute the truth of God. And I welcome that. I welcome that. When Paul went to Berea and uh, he spoke to the Bereans, he said they were more noble than the Thessalonians for they received the word of God with gladness and they searched the scripture daily to see if what I said was true. Search the scripture. Don't take my word for it. See if this is what God says. That's why we just keep going back spiritual to spiritual. What saith the scriptures? That's our that's our, our foundation, isn't it? That's our source of authority, our only source of authority. Turn to me to 2 Timothy. Chapter 4. Well, chapter 3 is that verse that we often quote, all Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture is profitable. Every bit of it is profitable to us. That the man of God may be perfect. <laughs> per there it is. You see that in verse 17 of chapter 3? That's what God requires. Perfect obedience. He's not going to settle for anything less. If he would, then Christ didn't have to come. If we could work out an obedience that would be, that would be satisfactory and sufficient for God, then, then Christ died in vain. I charge thee, chapter 4, verse 1, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. Now the word quick means to be alive. So God's going to stand in judgment of the Believer and the unbeliever. The believer is going to be judged in Christ and the unbeliever is going to be judged on their own works. Which way do you want to stand before God? I know how I want to stand. Oh, Lord, don't look on anything. Don't look on my best efforts. Don't look on the, the most sincere prayer I ever prayed. Don't look on the, uh, the, anything. Anything that I, the most selfless thing that I've ever done, though, Lord, don't look on it. I'll go to hell for it. If God judges us right now, and I know I've said this before, if this is so pointed and so true, if God judges you and me right now for what we're doing right now, outside of Christ, we're going to go to hell for what we're doing right now. That's it. We've come here to worship God. We're looking at God's word. We're preaching Christ. You see, we've got to be found in him. He's the only one that measures up to these passages. He's the only one that kept God's law. Does that mean that we are frivolous about the law of God? Does that mean that we don't love the law of God? No, we do. But we're looking to Christ He's going to judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Look at verse 2. Preach the word, therefore. <laughs> it's the only hope that men have. It's the only hope that you have. It's the only hope that I have is to preach the word when it's convenient and when it's not convenient. When you're preaching to people who love it and when you're preaching to people who hate it, you preach the same message. We don't preach one message to unbelievers and another message to believers. We preach Christ and him crucified. Because whether we are a believer or an unbeliever, that's what we need. That's what we need. And so Paul's saying to Timothy, I charge you before God 
Preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, and the time has come. You compare what you're hearing here to what's being preached out there in religion. The, the works gospel, the free will gospel, the, the, the word of faith gospel. You know, if you just, uh, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, all these different messages that are being preached out there, what are men doing? They are gathering themselves together with teachers that will tell them what they want to hear. I mean, you look at it. It's amazing. I used to have a higher estimation of men's ability to see foolishness. I used to not think, you know, people are not going to fall for that. I mean, they, they pack stadiums with tens of thousands of people to listen to somebody like Joel Osteen. What are they doing? You know, they, they, they've got these, I, would just, I mean, I could give you a hundred examples. You know them. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They don't want to hear about themselves being a sinner. They don't want to hear about Christ. They want their ears tickled. They want, a, they want to hear a message that's going to make them feel better about themselves. You know, before I knew Christ, I was preaching at a very large church. And I had come to understand some things about the doctrines of grace, which we don't use that term because there is but one doctrine of grace, and that's Christ. And it all stands or falls in him. But I had come to understand some things about the doctrines of grace, and I, although I had not been made totally depraved, God had not yet made me to be a sinner. I understood scripturally the doctrine of total depravity, and I preached it at a very, very large church and the pastor came to me the next morning in my office and he said uh, he said Greg he said I heard that message you preached last night he said you need to know that people come here to be made to feel better about themselves and that message you preached just made people feel bad about themselves we can't have that kind of preaching here I knew enough of the truth to where I left immediately. I mean, I was on staff there. I just left. I knew, I knew that wasn't right. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And that's all the false gospel is. It's just a fable. You can arrest the eternal salvation of your soul on a fable, on a myth, on something that's not true, on the figment of a man's imagination. That's all man-made religion is. But watch thou in these things, in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. How do we make full proof of our ministry? We preach Christ and him crucified. So in summary, go back with me to our text. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Only the Lord Jesus Christ could love God with all his heart, all his soul, and all, all his mind all the time and we look to him for our perfect obedience before God and in looking to him we do love God's law and in looking to him we do meditate on the things of God and we rejoice in the things of God thou through thy commandment hast made me wiser than my enemies for they are ever with me the Lord Jesus Christ, he is wisdom. He is wisdom. God has made him to be unto us our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. He's all our wisdom. And by 
grace. He gives us the wisdom to discern the difference between the enemies of God and the truth of the gospel. Amen? All right, let's take a break.